So uh, just a few things that we're going to talk about this afternoon. Um, probably everybody knows about Keysight now, but it's the first couple of slides here. Um, then uh, most of what's in the 5G dream and vision, blah, 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 has been covered by several people already today, so I'll probably slip through that. And then there are some challenges, measurement challenges specifically. Um, Liam and Mike and some others have given some really good insight as to what goes on on the design of some of the, um, particularly the millimetre wave components uh, and subsystems that go into a radio. Um, that's your problem. Our problem is to help you make the measurements on those things. And uh, um, measurement technology is always a little bit different from equipment technology for lots of reasons. I'll try and cover what some of those are and uh, see if we can make some sense out of what we can do. So, brief history of Keysight. Keysight was Hewlett-Packard. Um, our badges are still the same shape. Uh, um, uh, we, we are probably the old part of Hewlett-Packard. You know, the test and measurement was what Hewlett-Packard was built on, and uh, it's what Bill and Dave did. And uh, then it, we became a computer company, and we were just a little bit in the corner. Um, uh, 1999, we spun off from Hewlett Packard as Agilent Technologies. Um, Agilent Technologies split into a life sciences company, an electronics company, and the electronics company spun off as Keysight um, about three years ago. And uh, um, we're now back to being an electronic system measurement company, um, making all the same kind of stuff um, that Bill and Dave were making in the 1930s and 40s but working at gigahertz, not megahertz. And, uh, and, and, and it's still very, very exciting, some of the things that are going on. Um, anybody who's at uh, European Microwave Week would have seen um, us introduce a 110 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. It's got a big brother to the one that I've got in the room up there. Um, so, yeah, we believe in firsts. As a company, $2.9 billion last year, 10,300 employees. That's our chief boss person, Ron Nazizian. Um, and they're based in Santa Rosa, California. One of the nicest places in the world. It's one of the really nice places in the world. If you ever get a chance to go there, just on the um, threshold to the Sonoma County wine growing region, which is not only excellent wine, it's also very beautiful countryside. Um, uh, and as a company, we're trading in over 100 countries worldwide and we're manufacturing stuff, US, Europe, Asia uh, and Asia. Um, we have uh, a very, very significant manufacturing plant in Malaysia, but we're still manufacturing stuff in, uh, in various places in the US and also in Berlin and in Germany. Um, so that's key side. So 5G millimetre wave measurement challenges. Um, I've, there are challenges outside of the millimetre wave for 5G, but uh, millimetre ones particularly are, are, are challenging. So let's have a quick look at the 5G thing. Well, I think everybody's seen all this stuff already. Um, it's all about getting wireless communications to provide the same capability that we are coming to expect to get from things like fibre optic communications plus mobility. Um, uh, and it's going to be done in small packages, it's going to be done affordably, and it's going to be done everywhere. And to make it all happen, there's lots of new stuff going into it. I don't like um, PowerPoint beanie men, but uh, you know, basically it, it's all about everything from fixed wireless access to full mobile communications, to internet of things, and everything else in between. Um, I think one of the things that, one of the big weaknesses of today's cellular networks is when you get a lot of people together at a sports event, um, or a pop concert, or you know, an, anything like that, the service just grinds to a halt. LTE has not solved that problem. 3G didn't solve that problem. Um, 5G will solve that problem, um, they say. <laughs> uh, it will solve that problem uh, to, to, to a great extent. The, the capacity, the capability for capacity is very, very much higher. Uh, and it's easier to bring more capacity into an area if you need it. Um, 
It's also going to give us amazingly fast communications. It's going to give us much better reliability. Um, people talk about low latency. Um, there's a lot of issues about low latency. One of the things that counter counters the need for getting low latency is the need to have uh, very high reliability over a radio link, which is inherently not a very perfect medium. So we need error correction stuff going on. Error correction stuff implies time dispersion of information, retransmission or whatever. However you do it, um, it kind of fights you on the low latency thing. So where you need low latency, you need to have high reliability links, which don't need that error correction. Not going to go into that, that's your problem, not our problem. If you can make them, we can measure them. This has been covered a couple of times, at least the millimetre wave bands. One of the things that we've got particularly on here is that we just have to look not just into Europe, not just into the UK, but just look across the world and everybody has got a different idea as to where they can find spectrum uh, in the millimetre wave bands. Even in the RF bands actually there's a, I mean I think in LTE there's something like 40 different bands defined now. Um, about two-thirds of them are FDD bands, one-third of them are TDD bands, but they're all over the place. And uh, 5G is adding to those LTE bands and trying to squeeze more spectrum out of the spectrum regulators. Now, a little plug here for the uh, network operators rather than the spectrum regulators. Network operators want to have chunks of spectrum Regulators like to chop it up in little pieces so they can sell it off to more people and get more competition going between the purchase of licenses for spectrum. And for 5G to work successfully, we need to have wide chunks of spectrum. Um, and for, LTE to, uh, for 5G to work successfully, we need to be able to measure and test wide chunks of spectrum. And that's one of the challenges that, that we've got. Okay, so let's have a look at what some of these challenges are. Okay, so I did a word cloud, I just picked some text and threw it in there and got a word cloud and then I edited it out and got a slightly better word cloud. And, I, and then after I'd printed the slide up, I'd realised that some things don't work very well. So my word cloud generator always puts everything with a, a capital first letter. So my ACP, adjacent channel power, big problem for any radio designer um, or uh, amplifier designer, um, became a little CP. So there we go. But uh, I'll do a better job next time. I now know how, I now know how to do that, although I do get spaces. Um, so there's lots of things here. You know, we, we need bandwidth. Uh, we need good flat bandwidth. We need to control spurious emissions. We need to worry about harmonics. We have lots of new techniques to worry about, things like beam steering and beam forming and, and MIMO and all kinds of stuff. So let's have a look at what some of these things are. So one of the first things is just a quick review of how we generate modulated signals in, uh, in a signal generator. And essentially, almost everybody in test and measurement anyway, I don't know exactly how all of you guys do it, but we generate IQ basebands. We generate IQ basebands, and we then modulate that onto an IF and upconvert it to our output frequency. And we can do that for RF signals, and we can do that for microwave signals, and we, we do this essentially to get to millimetre signals. Um, and that would be all very good if everything were perfect, but it's not. So essentially, um, unless, our, unless our everything back here is absolutely perfect, our signal ends up with imperfections. We end up with images we don't want, we end up with non-flat spe spectrums, and we end up with carrier feed-through. And we might end up with some other things as well. So we get images, feed through, tilt, phase noise, spurious, and all those things come from our equipment to the out outside world. And that's one of the things that we need to look at and to see if we can do things better. Okay? Um, and this isn't the only way you can do it. You can do it this way. We can take our wideband arbitrary waveform generator. Instead of generating a pair of IQ basebands, we can generate an IF at some low, moderately low frequency. The arbitrary waveform generator we have in the demonstration room next door can run um, 12 giga samples per second with 12-bit uh, <coughs> digitization. We can run uh, 14 bits at 8 uh, giga samples digitization. So 
we can generate an IF signal at, at a gigahertz or two with that actually quite easily. We can get bandwidths at a, a few gigahertz. Um, and then we could upconvert that, so we could generate an IF here somewhere, maybe three gigahertz we could generate directly. We could upconvert that, filter it, and upconvert it again, and filter it again. In test and measurement, we're actually somewhat um, resistant to using filters, because as soon as we put filters into things, filters are somewhat imper imperfect, and filters tend to imply a filter per band. So if you're only interested in one or two bands, a technique like this works really well. If you want to be able to generate this signal at a few gigahertz for, for the RF microwave um, world and, and at tens of gigahertz for the millimeter wave world, you need to have a lot of flexibility. You have boxes with filters and switches. And they tend to degrade our signal in other ways. So. Whereas uh, our IQ baseband, we know what our impairments are there. We get different kinds of impairments here. We get particularly spurs, uh, images. Um, we end up with much lower signal levels, which need more amplification. Uh, amplification then adds noise, uh, which is never a good thing to do. Um, uh, amplification tends to reduce the accuracy because you need to put some uh, level detection loop, and, and that tends to be a little bit temperature sensitive. Uh, and then we also need band-specific filtering. So although this technique is, is a nice technique, it gives us some quite nice clean signals. Those clean signals are accompanied by some friends that we don't always want. Um, sometimes those friends, the spurs can be out of the way, oh, sorry, the spurs can be out of the way, uh, but if they're too close in, they become a nuisance and they'll degrade our ability to make measurements with those signals. Now another thing that's a very much important part of 5G is the fact that there are multiple antenna techniques of various colours and flavours. And basically there's three colours and flavours that we can talk about. Um, we can talk about MIMO, LTE and, uh, and um, uh, 80211AD both use MIMO techniques, 80211N, uh, AC and AX use MIMO techniques. Uh, MIMO techniques, essentially what we can do is we can get more capacity or mo more robustness or some of each by m transmitting differently coded versions of the same signal or differently coded versions of different parts of our signal on the same frequencies through different antennas that then go through different propagation techniques to our receiver antennas and then we use some very fancy maths to pull out the signal from this pair of antennas from the signal of that pair of antennas, even though they're on the same frequency. Okay, very simple technique, works really well, um, has some interesting challenges. It requires channel state information fed back from the receiver back to the transmitter. Um, this tends to in, uh, in, increase our latency because we need to have uh, techniques that will um, cope with the channel delay for that to work. Um, MIMO techniques can be used for both TDD and FDD systems equally well, um, and so that's been around for quite a long time. There's a technique called massive MIMO, which actually isn't really very similar to MIMO, <laughs> other than you have lots of antennas, not just a few, but you have lots of antennas. It can provide much higher capacity and essentially what happens in massive MIMO is you generate multiple signals with phase modification such that the signal that you want is placed so that the nulls from all the other signals that you're generating from your antenna all fall on that. So you only see the signal you want and, and you get nulls from the, other, from the other signals that are sharing your antennas. Um, that's essentially what's happening in massive MIMO. So you steer nulls to maximise your carrier to interference ratio for any, any one user and you do that for all the users at the same time which is where the clever maths comes in. Um, and in order to make that work you have to get an estimate of what is happening 
at the receiver for the signal that you're transmitting. And essentially the way that's done is to uh, rely on, on reciprocity in the channel and then this basically means that your system can really only work in TDD mode otherwise you can't really estimate your channel because there's too much interference from yourself. So uh, massive MIMO tends to work well in TDD systems. So there's a third technique and this is a technique that's being sort of uh, most work I think is going on for millimeter 5G which is beam steering beam forming techniques. So beam forming um, beam steering again uses um, multiple antennas um, we'll see an example a bit later on for a different reason within the presentation but we use a lot of antennas uh, and we tune the amplitude and phases of the signals from each element of the antenna so that we direct energy towards the receiver so we're not worried about some nulls now we're worried about the uh, energy and we're basically optimizing for robustness and it works well for wideband signals. So that's essentially what's going on there. Okay. So one of the things that if we have any technique that's using multiple channels sim simultaneously, we need to be able to generate multiple signals simultaneously. Now we could just go and sell you a load, big stack of signal generators and you'll go and get a big loan from the bank and go and buy something else. Um, it, it can become extraordinarily expensive to generate large numbers of channels. Um, so we've been looking at different ways of doing that. One of the things that we've got is a, um, a, a multi-channel arbitrary waveform generator. And in research labs this works really quite well because we can get very, very good time alignment from a lot of channels simultaneously. So each slice in this, uh, in, this, in this block here, each slice actually has uh, four RF generators, so there's four slices in there giving us 16 channels, and we can tandem up to get time synchronized uh, 32 channels from this, this equipment. Um, with calibration, we can time align signals to about plus or minus a couple of picoseconds, um, and, and we can generate those signals at a couple of gigahertz. If you now wanted to up-convert those, they, they, they could stay with the same time alignment, or we could calibrate it at whatever frequency you wanted it to be calibrated at, um, uh, but up-conversion becomes a, another challenge. Um, so time alignment is really good there. Uh, and one of the things we can do with this equipment is we can individually change the uh, time delay of each one of these channels individually by uh, um, a finite impulse response filter which can have its, per, its um, coefficient changed in real time uh, and that's running at our sample rate and so you can make very small changes to the coefficient taps to make very very small time delay adjustments uh, to those signals. Um, clever technique wasn't really designed for RF it was designed for something completely different um, but uh, it's become very popular with um, a group of researchers doing this kind of thing. Another approach we can do here is we can use um, modular techniques, so PXI modular techniques here. So each one of these PXI chassis has got four uh, RF transceivers um, and um, we can time align those to um, certainly um, sub, sub nanosecond uh, with calibration techniques and uh, generate multiple signals simultaneously. Um, eight channels here is quite reasonable, 16 channels becomes quite heavyweight, um, but at least we can get those out at, at microwave frequencies directly. So some of the reasons we might want to do that, well in LTE we have carrier aggregation. There's no particular time alignment required in carrier aggregation. Um, it, it just needs to be synchronized to you know, an antenna feed, uh, feed length kind of accuracy. It's not very significant. When we start looking at MIMO, massive MIMO and beam steering, then it becomes increasingly important that we get time alignment and coherent carrier generation and that's why 
uh, techniques like this uh, have become important. Okay. I mean that to happen. So um, going back to our signal generation blocks, why do we want to get better waveforms? Well, um, one of the reasons we want to be able to get better, uh, better um, quality in our signals is that if you wanted to measure something like the EVM added by a particular amplifier, you need to generate a signal, measure the EVM of that going into the amplifier, EVM coming out of the amplifier, and figure out how much EVM has been added by that amplifier. The problem is that if your signal going into the amplifier isn't very good, then you actually might measure something coming out that's better than what's going in because the amplifier might be equalizing a problem in the signal you had in the first place. So you really need to have very good signals before you start. So there are some techniques, there's some simple and less simple techniques that we have for improving the quality of a signal. And one of the things we can do is we can generate our IQ baseband, and instead of generating it as IQ baseband, we can generate it as an IF, so we have an offset IF. Uh, offset IF is, uh, has the advantage that it moves the carrier feed-through caused by imbalance in our IQ mixer away from the centre of our signal. We can put it outside the bandwidth of our signal. And that also takes the phase noise on that carrier leak outside of the bandwidth of the signal. So we're just left with the uh, phase noise at the offset frequency so that we get some significant improvement that way. It also moves images and spurs away from the, from the signal. So uh, it, ca it, it is quite a, a good technique. Um, it requires higher bandwidth in our baseband, which is not always uh, ideal. Another technique that we can use is the kind of quick and dirty technique of we can generate a signal, we can make a measurement of that signal with one of our signal analyzers, we can run a um, least mean squared equalizer on that signal, and we can then take the equalizer um, coefficients and pre-distort our, pre-equalize our signal going in to our modulator. And uh, that will give us a, a significantly better signal being generated by our signal generator. So that technique's reasonably good, but it does, um, it, it isn't perfect. And a couple of reasons why we, it, it's not advantageous to do things that way is that if we were to then go and measure our signal again, then if we measured it on the same equipment that we generated it on, it would look like a really good signal. If we measure it on something else, it probably won't look so good because we've actually compensated for the effect of our measurement equipment that we've used to calibrate the signal in the first place. Um, so we really need a technique where that doesn't uh, that, that doesn't occur. Another thing is that if we equalize the signal, it can modify the peak to average ratio uh, or the CCDF of the generated signal, which again might be not ideal. Um, and if we're testing something over different frequencies with different signal formats and at different power levels, we probably need a, different, a separate equalization for each, for each setting that we're going to test things at, which is a pain. So we've been researching and we've now got commercially available a signal optimization technique where we, we do something similar to this, but instead of actually equalizing the signal, um, we actually treat the error as a channel model and we, um, and, and we correct for that channel model in our baseband. And we do that with a calibration of the analysis equipment that we do that calibration with. So we call this uh, signal optimizer. And essentially what we do there is we'll start off with a signal analyzer and we'll calibrate that with a comb generator where the comb has a very well-defined um, amplitude and phase response for every, uh, every tooth in the comb, if you like. And so we can get a, a, a correction for our analyzer. And, and 
we then take that corrected analyzer and we'll take our signal source, we'll treat our signal source as having a, uh, a, a channel model added to it through our test fixtures, whatever you like, and we'll then feed that into our calibrated analyzer and we can then get a correction model for the test fixture so that we get a calibrated signal uh, at the uh, output of, or at, at the input to our test device, if you like. And then we can apply these two together so that we have uh, a, good, a good signal uh, out of our source and a, and a good measurement plane into our analyzer. So if we wanted to measure things like added EVM, um, we, we could put our component to test in at this point and, and get a, a much better analysis of what that component is doing to the signal. Um, this works for added EVM. This technique doesn't help uh, resolve the problem of um, uh, spectral regrowth or whatever. Uh, we have a different technique for that, which we've had for a number of years, where, where we um, kind of use pre-distortion. Uh, we can't apply the two together at the moment. But uh, that's the kind of thing that we're working on to get signals better. Um, just a quick uh, discussion of signal analysis. O over the last few years, one of the things that's happened with signal analyzers is... Um, a big increase in our ability to measure the instantaneous, uh, the, or to the, the uh, uh, improvement in the instantaneous bandwidth of signals that we can measure. If you go back not very many years, a typical spectrum analyzer would have maybe an IF bandwidth of 10 megahertz or 25 megahertz, and over probably the last 10 years, that's gone up from 10 to 25 megahertz up to 160 megahertz is kind of standard now um, uh, and up to a, a, a gigahertz of bandwidth. Now gigahertz of bandwidth sounds a lot to me as a s signal analyzer user but as for measuring 5G signals it's not very much at all. So we need to look at what can we do to get beyond uh, a 1 gigahertz analysis bandwidth. Well I guess we could put bigger and better digitizers into our signal analyzers if we could get them. Um, uh, essentially, we're, right now, today's state of the art is that we can, um, we can put a, an oscilloscope on the back of the spectrum analyzer. We can take an IF signal out of the spectrum analyzer uh, and we can measure uh, on most of our analyzers today um, with a moderately, uh, a, a moderately medium spec oscilloscope, we can get a two gigahertz bandwidth measured this way. Um, with our millimeter wave spectrum analyzer, we already have a five gigahertz bandwidth that we can do this on. Um, if you want to go bigger than that, then uh, we can go directly into a very high speed, very high performance oscilloscope uh, and rely on having massive oversampling to give us uh, the ability to get better dynamic range by downsampling and signal processing. If we want to look at multiple channel signals, an oscilloscope is kind of ideal. Other than that, it doesn't really have as much dynamic range as we always want. So we have some other techniques. We have a, a digitizer. This is an eight-channel digitizer uh, with a, um, a 3.2 giga sample per second digitizer. Give us about a 2 gigahertz of bandwidth. And we have down converters that will work with that that will take us up to 50 gigahertz or beyond. So analysis of multi-channel wideband signals is becoming within the grasp of everyday test and measurement. Um, down conversion is, becomes an issue for, for millimeter wave signals. Um, we can, uh, we have uh, a range of... Uh, external mixers we call smart mixers that will work directly with our spectrum analyzers and with our oscilloscopes to give us um, um, multiple gigahertz bandwidth uh, signals or gigahertz bandwidth signals that, that are down converted from a, above 50 gigahertz down to within the measurement range of our analyzers. 
So I think our IF out of this is something like 15, uh, I've done it again. My thumb's too big. Um, something like uh, a 15 gigahertz IF here that we can analyze. Uh, and uh, for our oscilloscope, we take that down to about six gigahertz, I think. Um, so, yeah, you have to do your own frequency planning sometimes, and, and this is it. Now, another challenge we have uh, working at millimeter wave frequencies is connect connectability. Um, we've been using small connectors like SMA for years. Everybody at RF is very happy to use an SMA connector. Um, SMA connector kind of run out, runs out of steam at about 25 gigahertz. There's a 2.92 connector which runs out of steam at about 40 gigahertz. If you want to go above that, then there are smaller connectors available. Um, they become expensive. Um, when you get above 67 gigahertz, there's a one millimeter connector available that works up to about uh, 100 gigahertz. Um, but it is extremely expensive, extremely fragile, and uh, you wouldn't want to use one in everyday lab use. You just, you just don't want to if you can avoid it. They become very costly, they're very fra fragile. And if you have to put one on a cable, it's like a specialist, specialist job. Um, you can use Waveguide. Waveguide is very low loss and very inconvenient to use. Okay. Um, sometimes we can take the measurement transducer directly to the device we're testing. So we, we've done, been doing this with power meters for years. You know, power head, clip it onto the front of the device under test, make measurements. And we can do that with our smart mixers, but it's hard to do that when you've got multiple channels, when you want to do multiple different <coughs> instruments and measurements. So uh, um, we're beginning to see more and more people looking at connectorless testing. This gives us another challenge, but uh, We've seen this mostly, I think, with 802.11 AD type of devices, uh, where the device maybe doesn't have a connector anyway. It has an antenna printed on one side of the chip and the electronics on the other side. Um, so we need to have a way of making these kind of measurements over the air. And uh, I think we, we introduced this box last year, which is a, uh, it's basically a, a baseband signal generator analyzer that works with a r remote radio head which has um, a, a horn antenna so we can do close coupling or moderately close coupling to the device under test. Um, and we begin to look at how we can use this for um, <coughs> making devices that have themselves multiple antennas. So uh, yeah, this is, this is one thing we're going to see more and more of. But then we have devices like this. Now, nobody's, I don't think anybody's shown anything quite like this today, but there are quite a few devices around. Um, I think somebody mentioned one of them earlier today. But uh, this is a, um, a beam steering transceiver chip that's got an 8x8 antenna array on one side of the substrate and uh, devices on the other side of the substrate and it can generate um, multiple beams, beam formed uh, simultaneously. Um, I, actually, this is a composite of about three different devices that we've looked at, and I must admit, I don't fully understand how any of them work, except that all of them have got analog beam steering elements, and none of them have any access between the beam steering element and the antennas elements themselves. So somehow you have to be able to infer the settings you need for the uh, beam steering devices from the beam pattern that you could go and measure. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. Now one of the things that we're trying to do with this is we're trying to generate some kind of beam shape. Okay. And the problem is that this beam shape is affected not just by amplitude and phase errors for the different elements going to the antennas is also affected by the normal things that screw up our electronics like 
amplifier compression and AM to PM conversion and, and, and stuff like that. So any of these things can destroy or damage or degrade the beam shape that we're trying to get. So instead of having a nice lobe, we're kind of splurging this kind of rose pattern out and it doesn't really give us what we want. Um, uh, so a lot of people have been looking at de designing devices like this have been doing an awful lot of modelling and then from that modelling they're trying to infer what they need to be able to do and then they're designing the components and testing the individual components then building the systems and checking to see if it really does what you want. How do you check to see if it's doing what you want? Well essentially you need an antenna test chamber and okay this is a very generic um, picture of what you might have. Uh, I know that in the LTE world there's uh, people building multiple antenna probe um, systems for testing transmitter and receiver beam patterns and it gets very complicated uh, and um, uh, takes a great deal of money but essentially at the end of the day you know we, this is just multiple antennas beaming signal at or receiving signal from the device under test. We swivel the device, we swivel the antennas, uh, probably in three dimensions, and figure out the pattern that we, we want to measure. It just takes a lot of time, uh, quite a bit of patience, and quite a lot of money. Um, but that's essentially what we're having to do. Okay, um, I could stop there. I just got one more slide, just talking, about, or two more slides actually, talking about device testing. Because one of the things that we see is that, you know, we've just, everything I've talked about so far has been about measuring, generating and measuring RF signals and, and measuring RF parameters. But at the end of the day, somebody wants to make a, a terminal, they need to know that that terminal is going to work properly. So one of the things that I really haven't covered at all is how do you test that your receiver is giving you the processing gain that you want, is giving you the performance you want. And that's actually quite hard to do because typically the receiver is going to be getting multiple beams of signals in, it's doing a lot of baseband signal processing, and there's some feedback going back to our transmitters. And uh, they, the measurement of receiver performance is not going to be bit error rate, it's going to be maybe packet error rate or block error rate or maybe throughput in an operational kind of condition. And that's actually quite hard to do. Um, so, I won't go through all these points here, but essentially we need to be able to generate a signal which is embedded in the protocol that the receiver will recognise, and it'll be able to feed back to our signal generator, and our signal generator needs to be able to modify its performance to do what the receiver says it needs to do to optimise itself. So we can do that in a number of different ways. One of the ways that we've done this, uh, and we've done this a lot, particularly with uh, LTE base stations, to some extent with 3G base stations, is to have some kind of test harness where we generate a signal and we emulate the feedback that's going from the receiver back to the transmitter and we're modifying our transmitter. And a test harness means you have to get a lot of things right and you have to have a lot of hooks and, and handles going into the device under test when it then can generate signals and analyze signals um, from the device in some way. Now with a handset world, um, we and our competitors typically have a thing we call the one box tester. Behaves like a base station, generates a signal, um, the, it puts the device under test into a simulated uh, operational call, in call condition, and it can then look at all the signaling messages that the device is sending. But we have to emulate a base station to do that. Um, and so there's two different techniques. If anybody went to Mobile World Congress this year, they may have seen we were demonstrating a 5G test capability based on our 4G test set, um, but with some real devices. Um, and uh, that's not publicly announced, but it was shown at uh, Mobile World Congress, and um, we expect to see that kind of capability 
as, as the 5G world develops. Okay, and just my last slide, just some of the things that we have done. Anybody has any questions on those? I've run out of time. Thank you, Helen.